Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at the Honolulu Fire Department Museum, ready to meet the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for tuning in to Island Focus. Explain a little bit more about the education program of the fire department. So a big part of our education program is trying to reach our keiki and ohana of the children of Hawaii. So when you say reaching the children, it goes into elementary schools? Yes, so in the elementary school, we have a firefighter safety guide, which we distribute to about 130,000 children statewide annually on fire prevention week. You still have Fire Prevention Week. Yes, yes. And I know there was a mascot at one time that went into the schools to encourage the children to pay attention. Yes, we still do have a mascot. Our first mascot is um, Sparky. He's our uh, safety bug. And he was introduced in 1985 by Fire Chief Frank Koho Hanohano and Mayor Frank Fossey. For the children to uh, connect and also to teach their parents. Yes. But now you have another mascot? Yes, uh, we do. So Sparky retired in 2015 and we introduced Pokey, our fire safety dog. And what better Image, mascot right? now to relate to children. And so yeah. Pokey goes into the schools yes. as well and, and helps the children learn and teach their parents. Yes. All right, Pokey, good job. <laughs> I have the pleasure of talking with Lisa Genoza today, who is Chief Judge with the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Glad you could be with us. And thank you for taking the time from a busy day. My pleasure, thank you for having me. I know you have lots of work ahead of you with this appeal process. Yes, we do. Could you maybe explain a little bit more about how your court operates and in the grand scheme of things, how we can understand it better? My court is the second highest in our state judiciary and it's one of two appellate courts in our state. So basically we have two trial court levels, the district court, mm -hmm. circuit court, those are the trial courts. My court is the first level of the appeals. And then if parties, uh, after they get decisions from my court, wish to appeal further, they can take their uh, cases and seek appeal to the Hawaii Supreme Court. And there also are cases that uh, can go directly to the Supreme Court, but they're sort of a limited uh, group of, of cases. So what I would tell you, I think the big picture is the vast majority of the appeals from the trial courts from throughout the state come up to my court first, and the majority of them are resolved at my court's level. So the trial courts are where juries happen. That's correct. Okay, and your court is reflecting on the decisions. Yes, we're reviewing a wide variety of types of cases, including cases where there was a jury decision uh, at the circuit court level. That's where the juries are. So this is a huge responsibility. Yes, it is. It and is. did you always want to do this? I never thought about being a judge <laughs> for the vast majority of my uh, either growing up or career. And it was really, it grew out of an opportunity that I had to, uh, after private practice, work at the attorney general's office uh, for five years under Attorney General Mark Bennett. And as part of that, when vacancies on the courts started opening up, people were approaching me and suggesting that I should think about it. And honestly, I, I had never thought about it for myself. So I've been speaking about that lately, how it's important for, uh, for, for, for those of us in my position now to reach out to those who may not be thinking about it, because if not for others, I may not have even applied. With the responsibilities that you have mm -hmm. um, and growing up in Hawaii, yeah. what do you see as the responsibility of communities you know, in, in shepherding the change? Boy, there's a lot of changes. Um, from, the, from the court's perspective, I think we 
try very, very hard to um, ensure that our decisions consider the impact on the entire community. Some cases, of course, are just related to the parties, but a number of the cases we decide have broad implication. And it's important for us to make our decisions understandable and, and to safeguard the community as much as possible within the confines of the laws that we're interpreting that are passed by the legislature or that are in our constitution. So in terms of shepherding the change, we, we feel a big uh, obligation and duty to faithfully discharge our duty to interpret the laws in a way that hopefully will benefit um, the community as, as a whole. And this Intermediate Court of Appeals came out of a community process. It, it did, very much so. How, were you involved in that at all? My court, uh, ICA for short, uh, was created out of the 1978 Constitutional Convention. So I think I was starting high school at that time. <laughs> uh, so uh, over 40 years ago. And in the 1978 Constitutional Convention, which delegates right from across our community are elected, they decided to, among a number of things that came out of that uh, body, they decided to create the Intermediate Court of Appeals because of the uh, the caseload that the Supreme Court was experiencing mm. and the growing caseload that they were experiencing, they decided that they needed a second appellate level. And uh, it, it passed, the, it got approved by the electorate in 1979. And in 1980, the first uh, group of judges for the Intermediate Court of Appeals uh, were appointed and, and started uh, the court. And over the course of the years since then, my court has uh, grown first to four judges, and now we have six judges. And it's a reflection of, I think, the growth in the population as well as the growth in cases that need to be resolved at the appellate level. So we have six judges now. We decide our cases in panels of three. Well, the fact that you're there as chief judge yeah. uh, and bringing a female perspective as well as a community perspective is much appreciated. Well, thank you very much. So just stay healthy. I'm very privileged to, to be in this position. <laughs> Appreciate you joining us as well on Island Focus as I converse with Lisa Ginoza, Chief Judge with the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Honolulu Fire Department Museum with Teresa Paulette, who is with MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Glad you could be with us. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you for inviting me. So we're familiar with the acronym MAD. But perhaps you can refresh our memories on what the vision is and, and your role there in the organization. We were started in 1980 nationally in Hawaii in 1984. Our mission is to end drunk driving, to help fight drug driving, to support the victims of this violent crime, and to prevent underage drinking. That's a huge mission. <laughs> it is, it is. What is your role in the organization? I'm the victim services specialist, which means that I talk to victims who have mm -hmm. been impacted by impaired driving, whether it be alcohol or drugs, and I reach out to them or they reach out to me and I help them with grief materials, grief counseling or court accompaniment, whatever it is that they might need. We had a recent uh, situation and an incident uh, in which visitors were killed uh, yes. and injured and it was a result of a drunk driver. How do you respond to a situation like that? What do you, what do you say to the public? It was a horrific crash. Um, we say that it's 100% preventable. It shouldn't be happening. Um, we say to the public that they can do something to stop drunk driving. They can set a good example for their family and friends. If they're having a party, they can encourage that people have designated drivers. If they're serving alcohol, of course, have designated drivers or call an Uber. Um, they can help support MAD. 
Uh, they can write letters to the editor when there are drunk driving issues that are prevalent. They can go down and testify in front of the legislature. Um, there are lots of ways that they can help and do something. You know, with alcohol being um, the drug of choice, let's say, yes. and so accessible, especially with our younger generation, do you talk to parents as well about not hosting parties that have alcohol? Especially at this time where now it's, you know, we're nearing graduation time mm -hmm. and proms and things like that. And yes, we want parents to know, first of all, the drinking, the legal drinking age is 21. So alcohol should not be accessible to our youth. And we do have things like Project Graduation, where they have the right. graduates go off for the evening. And they're safe. They're safe because there's no alcohol or drugs allowed. And prior to Project Graduation, we were losing many, many of our teens on graduation night. So you've come up with different ideas and solutions and strategies. Yes. How do we change the mindset at all that it's just not acceptable and besides not being legal? You're, you're exactly right. It is a mindset. And Matt has done a wonderful job in the 40 years nationally and 35 in Hawaii that it's no longer acceptable. It really truly isn't for most of the public there are still people that we're not able to reach. And so we have to do other things. If they do get arrested for DUI, then ignition interlock is a device that the, uh, the judge can put, yes, right. put on their car, have it put on, and then it monitors, if they want to drive legally, it will monitor whether they have alcohol in their system or not. And it'll be on there for about a year. So it gives them a chance to change this bad behavior, this, this irresponsible behavior. It lets them know, you know that they are impaired and they shouldn't be driving. Um, it's, it's continuous education, continuous public awareness. So when I was a principal in Kailua, and I know Carol McNamee had started this organization yes, here. Yes, she did. She's been very vigilant going into the schools. Have the schools been receptive to um, MAD coming in and sharing not only with the parents, but also with the young people? Yes, the schools are very receptive. And Carol is actually focusing more on the legislature and oh. public policy. And we do have some other speakers that are going out. But for 35 years, she has been down at the legislature, making sure that we close up the loopholes in the law. So with all of the, it's stressful, yes. and it is heart-wrenching. The victims were just pretty much plucked suddenly into this, this phase of having to deal with the police and the criminal justice system, along with grieving. And it's very compounded and complex grief that they deal with after a crash. They have no experience. Who, who does until this happens to you? So MAD is there. MAD knows how it is, Matt understands, and Matt has some, some help to offer, absolutely. With all of the stress and strain of the work that you do, you also have activities that bring happiness to the community. Uh, is there something coming up soon? Yes, on September 14th, we have a fundraiser called the Walk Like Mad, and it will be held at Ala Moana Shopping Center in front of Macy's, and it is a fun walk. And it's community, bring in your family, your friends, and everybody. It is our one and only fundraiser. We have lots of wonderful prizes. It starts at 7 and it ends before 9, so the mall can open. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for sharing that, and we'll be sure to share with that with the public as well. Thank you. You've had a chance to meet Teresa Paulette with MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Thank you for joining us. the opportunity today on Island Focus to talk with Adam Jansen, who is the State Archivist. I'm glad you're with us on this. Thank you so much to be with us today. Thank you. It is a pleasure. Can you please explain what the State Archives are, where you're located, and what exactly do you do? The State Archives has the duty, the privilege, and the honor of preserving the most important records of Hawaii. As we like to say, we're built on a, a foundation of four pillars. We have to protect your rights, your identity, your property, and your history. So any records that are produced by any government entity 
as well as nonprofit and people of note that touch on those four areas are preserved in perpetuity at the State Archives, which is on Iolani Palace grounds and has been there for over 110 years. So that's a lot of paperwork, a lot of books, uh, songs, memorabilia, I imagine? Absolutely. We have over 14,000 cubic feet of records with our oldest record dating to 1790. And we also maintain a collection of over 1,000 artifacts. Some of the most important objects in Hawaii's history are held in the public trust. And is it possible for the public to view them? Like, you know, we go to the Bishop Museum, for instance, and, and we look at the artifacts there. Absolutely, because these are not our records. This is the public archives, which means that everything in the archives belongs to the people. It is our job to protect these objects for today and tomorrow. So what might I find there? I, especially if I was born in Hawaii or even if I wasn't born in Hawaii? So from a genealogical perspective, most of our records date from the very earliest recorded records, keeping in mind that Hawaiian wasn't a written language until 1822. We have marriage records starting in the early 1830s, and they go all the way up in our collection up until about the 19-teens. So we also have land records, starting with the Great Mehele of 1848. Uh, royal patents, land commission awards, grant surveys, native and foreign testimonies. So if you're really interested in the history of your property, we have that. Rights. So we have all of the session laws going all the way back to the beginning of recorded history that were signed by the Mo'i, the, the royalty, as well as territorial and state session laws that have been passed. You know, I'm very touched by the fact that not having grown up here, you're so enthusiastic about uh, the responsibilities that are entrusted to you. It, it is a huge responsibility and an, an immense honor to be able to preserve these objects because the records and the artifacts that we have in the collection really tell the story of, of us as a people and how we came together to be where we are today. And so to preserve those and, and to see people come in is such an immensely rewarding experience. You know, I, I think I have the best job in the world <laughs> because having been in the archives profession for over 20 years, you know, you come to expect that people appreciate things, but not to the level that they do here. Because that concept of mana, that people who have interacted and physically touched have imbued that document with their essence is, is really incredibly moving. We'll have people coming in to do some land research and look at microfilm. Microfilm, not the original <laughs> documents, and break down in tears hmm. because, they, because they've seen somebody's signature, a relative that they've never met or interacted with. But to have that richness and that closeness with them is an incredibly moving experience. So I get your enthusiasm and your joy. What are some of the challenges of being in that office? We're almost out of space. You know, the building was designed 70 years ago. And the thought was, well, you know, as we're going into the 80s and 90s, yeah, everything's going digital. We're going to be an E environment, which isn't the case. Because there is something about the physicality, mm -hmm. somebody's wet signature that you cannot really capture electronically. So in the last 70 years, we're at about 93% capacity. And not only is it space from a holdings, but also a researcher perspective. You know, the research room is only so large. And as people are starting to get energized about their own history, we got more classrooms wanting to come in, and we can't accommodate that. We just don't have enough space yet. I, I really appreciate your comment about becoming aware of our own history. And as we wrap up this conversation for today, what might you say to the public regarding that? Come to the archives. We have such a rich, diverse, and deep collection that you know, we usually say, you know, we'll promise you at least three chicken skin moments. <laughs> You've learned that comment. I have. <laughs> that idiom. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, and we really appreciate the, the joy and gratitude I get that you have feel for being the State Archivist. It is a pleasure, thank you. We've had a chance to talk with Adam Jansen, who is the State Archivist. Appreciate you being with us as well on Island Focus. So this is a particularly significant part of the Honolulu Fire Department Museum. Yes, it is. There's a lot of memorabilia, a lot of artifacts in these displays that represents not just who we are,
but where we've come from as a fire department. And as I look at the photographs behind us, it, the fire department was started a long time ago. It was founded in 1851 by King Kamehameha III via city charter. And the king had a heart for his people. And he wanted a modern fire department that was organized and efficient that could respond to the needs of the community. Which is exactly what you folks do as first responders. <laughs> yes, and hopefully we, re we reflect that heart, that same heart that the king had in founding us. Hopefully we display that every time we go out, every time we serve somebody, um, every time we answer a fire call or a medical emergency, we want to display that heart. And when we look around here at the different helmets and mm -hmm. gear and um, equipment. symbols, equipment, there's been a lot of change in the department. But one thing stays constant is the heart. The heart and the pride. The heart, the pride. We have a very rich history, the Honolulu Fire Department. And it's the oldest department, but also the only one in the nation mm -hmm. founded by a king. It is. It's also the largest department west of the Mississippi. There are a lot of distinctions we have. And being founded by royalty is one of them. We have the only members who are awarded Purple Hearts. Well, from personal experience, I want to thank you because I've had experience with the fire department and you are awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm here with Rich Downs, who's the coordinator with the organization called Hui Manu Oku. Glad you could be with us. And you as well. Thank you for taking the time. Well, thank you for the invitation. So I'm not familiar with this organization. Can you give a little background and um, why the Manu Oku? Sure. Yeah, the Hui Manu Oku is a group of uh, organizations, institutions, and just private citizens who have an interest in the Manu Oku, otherwise known as the White Turn or the Fairy Turn. So and it's those little birds. It's those little white birds that, that you see. Uh, often you see flying <laughs> around. Sometimes you're fortunate enough to see them actually on a, a branch or in a, in a tree. Sometimes you're actually lucky enough to see them fluttering right in front of your face. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 They are a special bird, uh, mm -hmm. special for those of us that live here in Honolulu because it's not well known, but it is actually the official bird of the city and county of Honolulu since uh, 2007. I think it was given that uh, that designation as the official bird of the city of, of Honolulu because of its special relationship with the, this particular area. Um, it's a fairly common seabird throughout the, the Pacific, but uh, there's only one urban environment in the entire Pacific region where it comes ashore to breed, and that's right here in the Honolulu Waikiki area. I, I know a little bit about the bird uh -huh. um, just because it's, it's in my neighborhood, uh -huh. but I've seen them more and more in downtown Honolulu, and I, it uh, it touches me because they they're not distant. They they actually come close to you. Yeah, they. Uh, so the current population we date from 1961. We believe we're pretty sure they were here before, but they sort of disappeared from the record. In 1961, a, a pair, a mating pair, was seen over in Cocoa Head. Hmm. Was since then the, their numbers have increased to where I believe the numbers are a little more around 2,500 today. Uh, and they have expanded their, their breeding range. They come here to breed. They are migratory birds, but they come here for some reason to breed in the trees here in the Honolulu Waikiki area. One of the reasons we think that they are here and, and not elsewhere in the major Hawaiian islands and not elsewhere on Oahu, even though the same the species of trees that they prefer to breed in are available elsewhere, but they like the fact that we've improved, we, the arborists, the tree trimmers, have improved the habitat for them by trimming the trees the way that they do. Since the white terns are one of the very few species of birds that breed, lay eggs in trees without building nests. They have to look for structures within the trees that will help them to keep the egg in the tree. It turns out that the species of trees that they prefer are ones that when they are trimmed, nice little cups form the scar tissue, and that makes a place for them to, to lay their egg, makes it easier for them to keep the eggs in the tree. Now, did you grow up with these birds at all? Or? I did not. I'm from the mainland originally. Uh, I got acquainted with the Mano Oku um, about four years ago. And as a, uh, uh, an amateur ornithologist and bird photographer, I enjoy getting close to and observing, watching, studying, photographing birds. That's usually a difficult challenge. It's uh, often with birds, once you find them, about the time they discover that you were, that you were nearby <laughs> yes. and they see them, they leave, that's right? when they decide to fly someplace else. 
the, uh, the Mano Oku, uh, they don't mind being around people. In fact, if you look at the breeding map, it shows uh, where we have documented them breeding. They're most highly concentrated where there's most human activity. So they, they don't mind us being close. And when you are close to them, it's not unusual to actually be able to establish eye contact you know, with the yes. bird for the, for the bird to return that, that eye contact with you. That doesn't happen very often in the bird world or the world of wildlife in general. Why this bird, and what is the significance of the Manu Oku? For Hawaii, it's a uh, very special significance in that historically and culturally, it was an important bird. First of all, it's the, the name Manu Oku. Uh, it's the only bird that is named after Ku. Uh, we don't know exactly why uh, they, they chose to name this one after Ku, but we do know that it's also, it also has been very important uh, both historically and even up to today as an important navigation aid for the, the voyagers. You can use celestial navigation and other techniques to find island groups, but to, uh, to get from someplace out there far at sea to, to actually find land itself, you need other clues. And uh, the white terns, Mana Oku, since they are seabirds and they, they, have their, they, they raise their chicks and trees back on land, and they only feed the chicks fish. They have to go out to sea to find fish and then uh, take them back to, uh, to the birds. What message would you have to the audience as a, as a parting thought? There are ways that folks can become involved with, uh, with us to help us uh, do that. Uh, a number of different ways that, that they can do that. We have a website, www.whiteturns.org, where you can go there, learn all about uh, what we're doing, learn more about the, the bird. We also do monthly white turn walks. Uh, there's going to be one that's uh, usually on the third Saturday of the month, either focused on downtown Honolulu or downtown Waikiki. You can sign up on our webpage for that. There's also a Mano Oku festival coming up on the 18th of, of May at the Iolani Palace where uh, people can come and, and learn more about the, the, the Mano Oku and to learn more about the people who are interested in the Mano Oku. So the bird itself is, to me, is very, very interesting. But I will say one of the greatest pleasures I've taken uh, in the last few years uh, learning more about the Mano Oku is uh, to see more and more people become aware of and interested and form that special relationship with a very special bird. And probably enjoy the moments that we have with them. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. So thank yep. you very much for your time. We'll look forward to hearing a little bit more later. Certainly. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. We've been conversing with Rich Downs, coordinator of Hui Mano Oku. Aloha. Mahalo to the Honolulu Fire Department Museum for hosting us today, and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other. See you soon.